series of profiles in politics, you know, a chance to meet inspiring individuals who have, uh, who are stepping into the, into the arena or have, quite frankly have been in the arena of public service for some time. And, um, and I think it's important that uh, everyone have an opportunity to meet these individuals and just uh, really be motivated and inspired by them as, as I am. And today I'm really excited to uh, have with us uh, Heather Heidelbaugh. Uh, Heather has been described and I absolutely concur as I, the more I've gotten to, uh, uh, to know her and know her background and know her, her record of public service, she's been described as a trailblazer who rose out of humble beginnings. You gotta love that, uh, it's the American story. Uh, she worked her way through college and law school and, and became one of the most respected litigators in Pennsylvania, uh, leaving uh, shards of the glass ceiling far below her as she broke through. Uh, uh, when she was newly married in 1988, Heather moved to her husband's hometown of Pittsburgh where she uh, quickly became a partner in her law firm at at 30 years old, quite an accomplishment. Uh, there she uh, developed her reputation as a smart, hardworking, and effective advocate. Uh, the move to Pittsburgh would become a pivotal shift in her life as she began to uh, uh, raise her family. The uh, uh, years into her marriage, she discovered that her husband was uh, uh, afflicted with alcoholism, a uh, disease that would only take his life and uh, years of struggle would, would follow and Heather uh, took charge of her young family and, and made sure that both the children succeed in school and life and quite frankly in their careers. Uh, Heather worked in law and uh, her work in law and policy led to her appointment to the Governor's Commission on Judicial Appointments in 1998. In 2005, the administration of then President George W. Bush invite her to the White House to interview by, uh, for an appointment to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Two decades later, Heather became the chair of the State Advisory Commission on selection of a U.S. Attorney, United States Marshal, and Federal Judiciary. Now, work, following this service, Heather served in a variety of party and civic posts and became a familiar face and voice on Pittsburgh's television and talk uh, shows. Uh, talk radio shows where she uh, provided political analysis. Uh, her recognition, her recognized expertise made her a natural for the, the GOP nomination for Allegheny County Council's at-large seat. And as a lone countywide elected Republican uh, on the Allegheny County Council, uh, she was a voice of reason and restraint, advocating for less spending, lower taxes, and common sense public policy. Uh, both her legal and political resume stretched for, uh, for pages, uh, cataloging courtroom accomplishments and service to her party and the citizens of Pennsylvania. Uh, 35 years later, Heather Heidelbaugh is one of the most highly regarded courtroom practitioners in the country, an equity partner at her Pittsburgh firm, and a candidate, uh, a Republican candidate for the Pennsylvania Attorney General this November. So I am proud to welcome to Profiles in Politics, Heather Heidelbaugh, candidate for Pennsylvania Attorney General. Heather, thanks for uh, joining us this morning. Well, Congressman, thank you so much. I'm exhausted just listening to it. <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, I just want to thank you very kindly because as the Dean of the Congressional Delegation, what you spend a lot of time doing is focusing a light on others instead of yourself. And it uh, really exemplifies what kind of leader you are, because I think that you're always thinking about um, others uh, versus yourself. And by doing that, you elevate uh, the discourse in politics and you elevate your constituents. And I want to deeply thank you for that. Um, there's a lot of people who th talk a lot about themselves and you're not one of them. And so I want to thank you very kindly, as well as um, Marcy, for setting this up. And um, I, I, I take your lead, however you would like to uh, move forward with, uh, with the uh, Zoom meeting. Well, Heather, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, share your thoughts uh, surrounding your, uh, I don't know if there's anything additional details. Um, I, I didn't, you've got a really 
vast resume and record of public service. So I only touched on the on the high points, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, but also, I know that you are in the middle of uh, of a race uh, that we all need to be uh, be very aware of. That you know you're running for that chief law enforcement position, you know, within Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania. And, uh, there's some change needed in Pennsylvania. There's no doubt of that. I, you know, I think some of our most recent experiences, let alone over the past couple of years, have made that quite evident. And um, you know, why don't you talk a little bit about what experiences you you kind of that, that you're looking forward to bringing into the position as the next Attorney General of the, of the Keystone State? Thank you, Congressman. There, there's one thing I would love to talk about that I'm very passionate about. Um, this is something that that just occurred. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear, hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, so th there's something that happened, I think, that most people sort of would have missed that I think is, um, is very important for us to understand about my opponent. Um, there's a case called the Little Sisters of the Poor, and that was argued last Wednesday in front of the Supreme Court. And, you know, for the first time in our country's history, we were able to listen to argument contemporaneously. Um, the week before the argument, uh, Josh Shapiro told a lot of the local news that he himself was going to be arguing the case in front of the Supreme Court. And as a lawyer who's practiced every day for 35 years in 54 of the 67 counties, I thought that's probably not accurate since he really never practiced law. Uh, we have an attorney general who um, really never practiced law, has never been in a courtroom, uh, was affiliated with a law firm and went for the uh, highest job in the land. Um, so I, I figured he would not be arguing the case. And when I listened, of course, he didn't argue the case before the Supreme Court. And just to give you a, a, a thumbnail sketch of what the case is about, Josh Shapiro sued the Little Sisters of the Poor, which is an organization of nuns who have devoted their lives to the service of the elderly poor. And he sued them because it was his uh, belief uh, that the government should force uh, this organization uh, to provide various birth control uh, coverage in their insurance plan. And the Little Sisters of the Poor basically said, if, you for, if the government forces us to do this, this will violate our conscience because we believe providing the morning after pill um, is a mortal sin. And so during the argument, it was very interesting because one of the liberal justices, Justice Breyer, um, said to both attorneys on both sides, the government as well as uh, the Attorney General's office, you know, in a religious liberties cases, these are very difficult because both sides can't win, you know, there's, and one, when one side wins, it's often a terrible result. So what we really encourage litigants to do is to try to accommodate each other, to try to accommodate religious liberty and try to accommodate the interests of the government. And um, I would like to read to you a sentence uh, that the attorney who argued the case on behalf of Josh Shapiro and the attorney general's office said about the Little Sisters of the Poor this is an actual quote. Uh, they were arguing about whether the Trump administration's exemption to allow the Little Sisters of the Poor to continue to operate uh, without violating their conscience um, was whether that exemption should be stricken. Quote, it allows them the exception to prevent virtually any employer or college to opt out of providing contraceptive coverage entirely. Now, this is the key part of the sentence including for reasons as amorphous as vaguely defined moral beliefs. And what the attorney went on to argue was that the Little Sisters of the Poor should be required to go into court and to prove, prove their moral beliefs. It's insufficient for Josh Shapiro, for the Little Sisters of the Poor who've devoted their lives um, to the Lord and devoted their lives to the helping other people at, at at, of course, no salary. It's not enough for them to, um, for him, for them to stand up and say it is their conscience um, that would be violated if they were to be associated with an insurance company who provided uh, drugs to kill a baby. You have to come into court and to prove that your moral belief um, is actually valid. And many of the justices said, you know, our country uh, was built on um, allowing exceptions uh, to, to government rules. We have a conscientious objector status for those who feel that they cannot serve the country in war. We have 
uh, exceptions for people, for instance, in our own state, commonly known, the, you know, the Amish are, ex are exempted from certain rules. Can't, can't you, the government, allow the Little Sisters of the Poor to continue to operate? And Josh Shapiro said, no, the Little Sisters will bend to the will of the government. And if they do not bend, because we won't, if they do not bend, they will go out of business. We will force them out of business. Now, this is a topic that probably will not be discussed um, out on the husk, Huxings, and it's a, it's a complicated topic, perhaps. But, but is there anything more important about this race than this topic? You know, we live in Pennsylvania, uh, founded by William Penn, who went to my uh, ancestor's homeland in Germany and advocated that Germans come to Pennsylvania for religious freedom in 1650. My own ancestors came over in 1750, located in Lancaster. Uh, this entire Commonwealth, Penn's colony, was formed for religious freedom. Um, our First Amendment, which is our inalienable rights as human beings, not because we're Americans, but because we're human beings, we have these rights. And in the First Amendment, the most important uh, uh, amendment for our Bill of Rights is right up in front religious freedom. And so, you know, to all those listening, I say, you know, is this the sort of person that you want to be the lead lawyer uh, in our great commonwealth, a person who would force others to bend to the will of the secular government uh, and deny your moral conscience? Um, there's a, a myriad of other reasons um, why this attorney general, I think, uh, needs to end his tenure as attorney general, number one. He has uh, stated many, many times that he would like to be governor. He refuses to say that he will not run for governor. Um, I'm happy to say that I will never run for governor. I would love to serve, uh, obviously, two full terms as attorney general. I'm a working lawyer. I have been for 35 years. I would like to be the lawyer. Uh, and, um, you know, the, there's a, there's a number of other things uh, that I think that... Um, tell us why Josh shouldn't be there. Um, he's failed to exercise power uh, when he had the ability to exercise power. The legislature was so alarmed about the crime rate in Philadelphia with um, District Attorney Krasner, who was funded by George Soros under this scheme to put in public defenders as prosecutors throughout America. The legislature said to um, Josh Shapiro for the first time, really, uh, since the Attorney General has been an elected position, the, the Philadelphia District Attorney is not prosecuting gun crimes. Therefore, we're giving you concurrent jurisdiction. And Josh Shapiro, not only in the written press, uh, but in uh, video recordings, which we have, has stood up and said no, no to the people of Pennsylvania through their elected representatives. I will not do what you're asking me to do. I will not pr prosecute illegal gun crimes. In addition, um, Josh Shapiro has mismanaged the Attorney General's office. Um, and I think that he's mismanaged it because he was never a lawyer. Uh, the Attorney General's office is 850 individuals, hundreds of lawyers, 67 counties, thousands of cases. It is a huge law firm. I've uh, tried some of the biggest cases in the country. I've managed big cases. I've managed teams in litigation. I know how to do that. Uh, there was a case in Luzerne County in which 40 uh, drug defendants were being prosecuted by the AG's office. $2 million, two years of work. And uh, the AG's office failed to file the proper paperwork, and all of those criminal drug defendants went free. In the western part of the state, in federal court, in front of Judge Nora Berry Fisher, uh, the Attorney General's office has been cited for repeated failures to meet deadlines and is facing contempt motions uh, because their lawyers are not properly filing the paperwork that they need to file. Um, in addition, he's expanded his authority without a legal basis. Um, Never in the history of Pennsylvania uh, has the Attorney General had a fair labor division. When uh, Josh Shapiro began office, he created a fair labor division. And that work of that current unit was always done by the Bureau of Labor and Industry. Let me give you an example. So if you were an employer and you failed to properly pay your employees through inadvertence or a mistake, or perhaps intentionally, um, the, the um, Bureau of Labor and Industry uh, would come into your office and was a very, you know, uh, unpleasant experience, and they would do an audit. Uh, and you were facing regulatory um, 
issues, you were facing fines, perhaps attorney's fees, if you improperly paid your employees. What Josh Shapiro has done is he has sent in armed agents of the Attorney General's office into a company called The Good Company in, uh, in Center County, in, in State College. He charged Mr. Good, Scott Good, with 100 felony counts for failure to pay what is alleged, not proved, alleged to be 68,000 in underpayments to employees on a multi-million dollar construction project. Um, he's done this to another company. Um, I could give you countless examples of how he has tried to expand his authority during this pandemic. Um, he has said things, I listen to him every day, I read what he uh, puts out, his press releases, I listen to what he says to TV and radio. You know, he has, he has acted as if he is an, uh, the, not the governor, okay, because the governor has expanded his authority as well, but he has acted as if he is a ruler or a king. Uh, he has not tethered himself whatsoever to the authority that he has, which is outlined in the Commonwealth Attorneys Act. Um, he has said repeatedly that people did not have to pay uh, their rent, when of course people have to pay their rent. Um, they can certainly work with their landlord in this horrible circumstance that we are in to have forbearance, but he has led people to believe that they had some sort of exemption from paying rent. Um, He's often motivated by politics. Um, I am a person who um, does not have a ladder in front of me. I don't have a plan to be president. Our attorney general has been taking coaching lessons so that he can speak like President Obama. Um, and uh, his ultimate goal is to, to run for president. Um, I have a goal and the destination is the attorney general's office. It is not a stepping stone. Um, on, on many occasions, I think he has misled the public by his rhetoric, um, leading people to believe, as I just um, indicated, that not only is he going to argue a case in front of the Supreme Court, but that he's got the power to uh, tell uh, people that they don't have to pay their landlords. So these are just um, some of the things that I think that, um, you know, that sort of the broad topics of why we need to have a full-time attorney general. Um, the race for governor begins in 20, is 2022. Some say people will run for that for almost 18 months to two years. I think it's his plan to be reelected attorney general and then immediately uh, to begin to run for governor. And this office sorely needs a real lawyer who will engage in the work of the attorney general. We're the fifth largest state. Uh, there's five or six offices of the attorney general, and, and people desperately need the work done in the attorney general's office. Well, Heather, thank you. Um, you know, uh, Pennsylvania desperately needs a professional attorney, one that it actually has done the job, done the work, and brings the vast experience like you have. Um, and and we're, we're lacking that right now. And quite frankly, what your comments that you made about, you know, uh, of uh, our current attorney general being really power hungry, uh, of, of claiming power and authority, expanding the office without the, the authority to do that. You know, uh, elected officials who do that, that represents tyranny, uh, where, where you go outside the bounds of the Constitution, defining of the office that you're elected to. And... And nobody, I don't think anybody in Pennsylvania wants somebody who's looking over uh, their current duties and responsibilities just as a stepping stone uh, to another office. Um, I, I, my observations, and you just affirmed that with what you shared, our current attorney general is more concerned with what George Soros or Nancy Pelosi are doing than what everyday Pennsylvania families need for protection. Um, it's about politics for him, you know, versus uh, public service. And, and um, you know, and the attorney general position is a very important part of our justice system, an incredibly important part of the justice system. And there's a reason that Lady Justice is represented with a, a blindfold and holding scales, you know, because it's not to be influenced by politics, whether it's your own personal politics or the politics of, of a liberal party. And so I know that we have some questions that uh, came in in the chat. So I'm going to hand things back uh, to uh, Marcy to kind of moderate some of those questions for you that people have submitted. Thank you. Okay, Heather, here we go. Um, so 
one question we have from Rob is saying that, you know, Shapiro is very popular in Philadelphia. And how can the rest of PA overcome his advantages in that part of the state? Great question. So this is the conventional wisdom. Everyone believes this. Um, and I fought this for a, a good three or four months until the Commonwealth Foundation, which is an, um, a conservative think tank located in Harrisburg that many people probably on this phone call know about. They did a poll. I didn't even know they were doing it. And they pulled 770 people throughout Pennsylvania, uh, cell phones and landlines, 44% of whom uh, lived in Philadelphia or the collar communities. And there's three pieces of information that came out of this poll that I think will um, encourage you uh, that this is a very winnable race. Number one, 64% of those polled didn't know who Josh Shapiro was, didn't recognize his name and could not say who the attorney general was. So we all think he's very popular, um, but 64% don't know him. Number two, of the 34% who do know him, 35% like him. He has an enormously low approval rating for an incumbent. What a pollster will tell you is that if an incumbent has a, an approval rating of 35% or below, they are very vulnerable to being um, picked off by a challenger. Now, Josh's Shapiro rating, Josh's um, approval rating of 35% was actually by adding two categories, which was approval, approve of, and somewhat approve. So his actual approving, approval was down in the 20s, is a very low approval rating. In addition, they asked a question, it's called a push poll. Um, and they provide good information about Josh, and then what we would think is, you know, uh, not good information about Josh. And they said, if the election were held today, who would you vote for? And 44% um, at the end of February said they'd vote for me, and 37% said they would vote for Josh. Now, the other interesting thing is political scientists will tell you that in Pennsylvania, gender and geography play an enormous role in a statewide race. And so a woman from the West has almost a two percentage um, uh, uptick in, in statewide elections. And we've recognized that phenomenon over the last decade. Um, the, my predecessor who ran for this office was Senator Rafferty. He was from Montgomery County out in the East. He was a senator. He had obviously good, you know, semi good name ID out in the East. He only lost by, I think it was 1.8%. Um, and he um, unfortunately was, was not funded very well. He um, was um, outspent $4, $4 to one. So um, if I have a 2% natural uptick because of my gender and geography, and the last race was only lost by under 2%, this is a real horse race considering the poll. That's excellent. And so, uh, you know, another question was, what do you see as your best approach to, de to defeating Shapiro? So um, maybe just expand on that. Thought. Yes, I think that, you know, what professionals are telling me, although I uh, did major in political science and economics in college and, and actually majored in campaigns and have worked on many, I rely on the uh, experts in this field to sort of guide me. Um, the experts are saying that I, you know, obviously need to become known um, as an entity. Um, I have some uh, recognition out here in the West, having been on uh, television uh, as a political analyst uh, on and off for 20 years. Um, and having served in, in government in Allegheny County. Um, but I need to get known, and I also need to define my opponent. And, um, you know, I think that, um, especially with um, Mr. Shapiro's pronouncement yesterday, um, that he supports uh, the governor's actions. He said that the governor's threats yesterday um, have the full force and effect of law, which, of course, is, is, is not true. Um, the governor has no authority to prevent federal dollars from going into counties. Um, so I, I think that Josh Shapiro's actions uh, during this time in which he should have exhibited leadership, um, you know, one of the things that I put out on social media um, is uh, the disaster that is unemployment insurance. Um, President Roosevelt, uh, back during the time of the Great Depression, um, states began to have unemployment compensation as one of the safety nets for our society, which we all have come uh, to understand and expect as a safety net in times of, you know, catastrophe. Um, the uh, unemployment compensation computer has been a disaster uh, for a very long time, and Governor Wolf knew about it on the day that he came into office. He's done nothing about it, nor has Josh Shapiro. Uh, instead of Josh Shapiro getting on TV and radio, 
during the uh, 60 days of this pandemic to discuss the Pennsylvanians who haven't had an unemployment check, many of whom have no food because we have some of the largest food lines in America. He has talked about toilet paper, 250 press appearances. Yes, we have counted them. <laughs> he has been on radio and TV talking about how toilet paper is overpriced. Now, I, like you, want to make sure that we all have enough toilet paper and that it's relatively economical. But when you're talking about the importance between the price of toilet paper and whether a single mother raising three children hasn't gotten an unemployment check in eight weeks, there's a priority there, and he has failed to address it. And why has he failed to address it? Because that would require him to criticize Governor Wolf, who's in his same party, and he won't do that. He's never going to call out the obvious because of politics. And that's not a leader. That's a politician. Mm -hmm. So I have one more question for you, Heather. And this is from Ray, who is in the Du Bois area, so kind of Clearfield County. And he says, what can we do for you up here in North Central PA? How can we share your message? Thank you very much. My uh, website is www. HeatherHeidebaugh.com, no space, no period. There's a lot of information there you can download. What I ask everyone to do is to definitely engage in social media, share uh, portions of my Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, all of the things that didn't exist when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> get on the website, copy it to your social networks, which has an exponential effect. Um, if you can, please donate on the website. Uh, this is going to be a very expensive race. Philadelphia media is very expensive. Uh, but I just need people to say, you know, I met her and I think she can win. Well, Heather, um, you know, uh, <laughs> had 250 press conferences talking about toilet paper. That is awful. Temp. There are some, I can think of some pretty creative, but probably not appropriate ways to summarize that. But uh uh, it just speaks volume. Uh, I, I want to just uh, kind of finish up by talking about the importance of the attorney general position in terms of checks and balances, because I do look at our, our state row officers as checks and balances uh, to, to whoever's in the, you know, whoever's in the governor's mansion. No, I, we're in, uh, and I don't care whether it's a Democrat or Republican. You know, and, and quite frankly, the checks and balances should exist, whether it's, you know, a, um, you know, a Democrat uh, attorney general and a Democrat uh, governor or a Republican attorney general and a Republican governor. You know, it's it's important. And uh, when you had reflected on on this week's press conference uh, where uh, as, a, as opposed to being a cheerleader for Governor Wolf, any attorney general should have been saying, blowing the whistle and saying, oh, time out, you know, foul, throwing a yellow flag, you know, because the, the governor goes on his press conference and, and basically talks about how he has the authority to stop federal dollars that Congress approved in the CARES package from flowing, 45% of that was to flow to the local counties and municipalities. Uh, he doesn't have the authority to do that. He doesn't have the legal standing to do that. And where is our chief executive law enforcement officer that should be throwing the yellow flag and saying, you know, time out. You can't do that. Instead, he's cheerleading wrong. And then, and I'm not an attorney, but it, it's apparent that the second point that the governor made, uh, where the governor said, claims that he can interfere with contractual law. That a, that a business who went out and did the right thing, responsible thing, and purchased liability insurance uh, for their business, that the governor is also saying that he has the ability to, and he's going to dictate that these businesses, if they don't follow the, the governor's dictates, uh, these businesses will not be able to use the contractual um, uh, provisions of, of liability insurance. Well, I'm not an attorney, but contractual law seems like you know, he's in, again, he's, he's blowing it when it comes to contractual law. So where is, you know, where's our current attorney general, Mr. Shapiro, on that, as opposed to blowing a whistle and throwing a yellow flag and saying, time out, governor, 
you know, I appreciate maybe what you're trying to do, but you don't have the legal stand to do that. He's just in collusion with him. He's encouraging him. So um, that is one reason uh, among many uh, Pennsylvanians deserve strong checks and balances in the attorney general office uh, for this governor and any, quite frankly, future governor as well, no matter what the, what the party is. That's right. You know, it, there's a right and there's a wrong. And uh, when our side uh, commits a foul on the field, you know, the flag's got to fly. Um, and you have to be, you, you know, you have to have inner strength uh, to be able to stand up and say and do the right thing. And I've exhibited that uh, throughout my career. You know, uh, Congressman, I think that the um, threats uh, about failure to have insurance was, was really a low blow. I mean, he had his insurance commissioner come out and say that if you opened up violating um, the governor's order, you may not have insurance. Um, I, I think, you know, he was throwing Pennsylvania businesses under the bus because you know, what he was trying to do through that, I think, is to embolden, um, you know, insurance carriers to say, you know, you don't have coverage if you were operating your business during this time. And why would any governor do that? Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm issuing a statement. Um, I, was, I was appalled that he called Pennsylvanians cowards. Uh, there is nobody who can govern a people when you call your own people cowards. That was completely not the words of a leader. Yeah, and to have an attorney general who failed to uh, uphold the law uh, and intercede, instead of cheering the governor along, um, that either represents um, uh, politic, bad politics, or quite frankly, incompetence, a lack of understanding of what the law is that needs to be defended. Uh, so, uh, Heather, you've already uh, uh, kind of shared your website, and people can go to that website to make a, uh, to, to contribute. It takes, takes significant resources to run statewide. I'm proud to support you and would encourage everyone else to, to uh, do that as well. Uh, for those who are on the Zoom call, if you've, you know, hopefully you've, you, you've seen an amazing profile in politics here of Heather Heidelbaugh, who needs to be our next state attorney general. Uh, if you want to help share the word on that, uh, this this call is recorded, and we will make sure that that gets posted uh, to my campaign website. Obviously, can't do it on the official side, but the campaign website at gtthompson.com. And Heather is going to be you're welcome to obviously. We'll make sure you get the link to be able to share it on your website. Uh, Thank you. And what we would ask of those who are listening in, uh, you know, drive your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, your in-laws, your outlaws, anyone you know, to, uh, to this link uh, to be able to hear directly from Heather uh, and see what a, an amazing uh, person she is and what a great job she'll be, uh, will do as the next uh, Attorney General from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Heather, thanks for, for being in on uh, Profiles in Politics. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much, Congressman. And thank you, Marcy, for inviting me. All right, y'all take care. Everybody stay well, stay healthy. Enjoy your day. Thanks so much, everyone.